Okay, here I have a Sony amplifier. Looks like a F242, whatever the proper TAF242 it is. Probably a sort of early to mid 90s or something type era one. And the guy who bought it, he bought it second hand somewhere with some speakers and said it was actually crackling. And um, he did notice when he gave it to me that yeah, there's a bit of rust on the bottom here. And I thought, oh, that's probably just from being sitting in a garage or whatever. But it turns out there's quite a bit of green in here. So these, all these links, the ends of the resistors, the, the bottom of this heatsink here, have a bit of verdigris on them. Same with this, so they're pre-drive chips, so I did suspect it could be something to do with pre-drive chips, but I wasn't expecting them to be turning green. Screw there's really rusty along with the earth. That screw's super rusty. Power section doesn't look too bad. The front panel I think's escaped, but without looking at the components on the other side, I guess what I'll, next thing to do would be to take the, the bottom access panel off. And let's see what the the bottom side of the circuit board is like. Because if it's too bad, it might not be worth wasting time on this thing. But uh, it looks like it's actually good down there. So that's something. Just see whether it's blackened around any of the solder joints or anything. Because it'll tend to, if it's had a lot of water, it'll get in and actually get under this green lacquer and make it go sort of black. This looks actually okay, we're in our driver. It looks like one of the driver chips. I see staggered pins. They actually look okay on the bottom here. Output stage looks good. That one's my, that's my big guy, so I think it's just the flux has gone a little bit shitty around there. So yeah, it might be up for an hour or two's work to disassemble and clean this at a minimum. Uh, that resistor here has got like a growth of rust or something growing on it, so that sort of thing may need replacing. Board on the top side certainly needs cleaning. I think this upright board is looking okay, hopefully the switch and stuff. The main problem now is like getting a replacement for that function switch that, that goes via this little mechanical link to the input select knob and uh, you can just make out it sliding the black plastic bit there so I might power this up even and it's a little risky I don't want to blow any speakers or anything volume control feels okay but yeah that's a shame when someone's left it somewhere to this is Got quite a bit of muck. I mean, someone could have bought this from a tip shop or who knows where it came from, found it in the curbside collection or something, but it wouldn't get that corroded just being outside for curbside collection for a day or two or whatever, something like that. So someone's had this somewhere. There's a resistor there looking really bad, little one eighth watt resistor. And yeah, just these links and stuff. So yeah, I think this is going to need a bit of work. Definitely wants those chips desoldering. Looks like they're a UPC something from NEC. I wouldn't, given the condition of them, I wouldn't be surprised if one of them's faulty, but it may not be. I don't think there'd be anything conducting none of these links. I guess the next thing is to give these links a little bit of a flick and see if they've actually still intact and they do seem to be physically okay sometimes a bit of corrosion will eat through something like that and same with even these resistors little transistors so this part of the board's not too bad it's mainly this section along here that chip's got a lot of corrosion on the heatsink this one has a little bit so it's been wet quite wet for quite a while probably poorly stored in some sort of shed or something like this has actually had probably rainwater or something actually pouring on it or the other option is have a bit of a sniff of it, it doesn't smell too bad 
sometimes you'll get a cat have a, a bit of a leak on it, or urine, urinate on it, um, or some other pet, which of course is fairly corrosive stuff, or some person's poured beer in it or something like that, so it doesn't look like, usually if it's a cat or something, you can soon smell that, and normally it, like it does have a bit of a smell to it, but not bad, and it could be a drink. Though normally they leave a sort of layer of stuff. Interesting, it's the other thing, it's got these almost looks like some sort of blossom. Pretty sure that's blossom off a tree or something, so it's more likely it's been stored in a garage or something. It probably just had a small amount of water getting in there, may have been covered up with other stuff which caused it to stay damp and corrode. But I've seen a lot worse than this, so it's not that bad. It's not like it's had sort of batteries leaking it or something, that sort of condition, so... But yeah, you wouldn't know. Also notice this plug's got something on it. Like dirt or something, so... It's another sign that... Who knows where someone got this from. Some old shed or something that's been lying in the dirt on the ground or something. Probably in some farm shed or something. As people do, they shove it out in the... The woodshed or anything, that's where I've got a pair of Tandy speakers from. <laughs> They've actually been in a woodshed for quite a while. Which sort of hurried up probably the foam failing on the speakers, but they're known for doing that anyway. Surprisingly, the cabinets survived pretty well on that. But it could even be something as simple as these earth connections or something. I don't know how critical they are, but that's just super corroded. The screws just rust on top. I can't even get it to come out just pure rust on the head and then it's just green and rust but this thing's going to need the circuit board cleaning if it's going to be reliable what is oh that was a washer i think i think there was a washer underneath that and it's yeah it's a one of those washers anti-shake type washers and from the look of it half of it's missing i might at least power this up and do a DC check on the outputs is always the first thing before you look at your speakers. Or well, if the protector comes in, it should be a good sign. It's got a relay in it, it's always a sign it's got speaker protection. Let's see if that clicks in. Mm, not so far. I mean, some of these Sonys are a bit slow. hearing that click in I assume that must be speaker protection it could be a standby relay but let's have a look underneath it's got two sets of contacts which go to oh no they go to earth that looks like it comes towards the outputs to me I mean it says protector it's actually got protector written on the board there so it might be what that IC is that probably here yeah, the IC is connected to the relay coil I think this might have a bit more than just a problem with making a crackling sound. I'll turn that on, Better make sure the power's on. I was going to check where that connector went. It's a four-way connector. It actually goes to the power. Oh no, it goes to the, okay, it goes to the speaker selector knob here. A, B, A plus B on off. So that would be our speaker output, and that we should have wires, yep, that go to the output terminals. So I think this amp might have a bit more wrong with it than just being a bit crackly. Or if it was crackly, it's since blown something. Yeah, I've got to find where that relay was again, so case should be earth, assuming that... Well, if I can go to that big thing on the capacitor, if you see these things, all the tracks emanating from the one point. Let's see what we got on there. That in the shot of the camera. So we've got 46 volts on that cap. And we should have minus on this one. Oh, maybe that's the. Yeah, minus 47. So, to the relay, you've basically got these two terminals that are further away. Probably a bit hard for someone who's not familiar with these things, but the relay is these six terminals. If I stop shaking a bit, we've got four pins there, which are our speaker connector. Got two pins here, which would be the the contacts of the relay that go to the speakers on the speaker side. We've got two more, which is the other side of the contacts. Normally, 
and they're connected to the amp they're normally open when the power's applied they connect this term oh there it goes it actually just clicked in it took that long for the <laughs> for the i just heard the relay click so maybe it's got dc to start with there's no dc but either either way we've got two pins that are far away and they're next to this little chip and two pins that go to the speaker connectors are obviously the switches and the ones nearest to them are the other side of the switch which actually go to the output of these transistors be the collector of both of these so they're easy to check you've got two, a coil which should get a voltage around 12 volts coming into it in this case 24 volts should be ground on the other side or virtually nothing and there's no point measuring the speaker side of the relay if if um, the relay is not clicking in if it's in protection mode because that will obviously be disconnected because the whole idea is this little chip here measures the same terminals the output of the amp that come into the relay switches here the contacts on the output of the relay and if there's any DC there it prevents any voltage going into this coil so the relay doesn't click in so there's no point measuring anything on the output the speaker terminals or the speaker side of the relay because it isn't actually switched so there's no connection there, just hanging there, disconnected. So you've got to go to the other terminals, the ones that are hooked to the amp outputs, and check if there's DC there. Because like I say, no point using the speaker terminals in this. I mean, the best test is, is if the relay clicks in, there's obviously no DC. I don't know why that one took so long, but like I say, there may have... Let's switch it off. It may be a heat issue. It may be something in the protection circuit's faulty because of the corrosion. And it may also be there's because these chips are corroded the pre-drivers that they're not biasing these transistors properly and therefore there's some sort of dc at first and maybe as it warms up or something they come come good again let's see if it kicks in it, like i say could well be a problem oh there it goes so that's now working so we can actually hook this amp up to a signal, at least I know it's got a protector in it, so it's, if you've got a protection circuit in it, if anything goes faulty, which can happen when you've got corrosion and stuff, or dodgy chips or something, um, at least it will disconnect the thing. I'll switch that, or I'll go to A and B, because then I know I've definitely got it. But it'll disconnect it, if the amp does something silly, it'll disconnect that before it blows any of your speakers up. I don't think I ever got around to hooking some fuses. I can't remember if I did or not on here, but normally I put some fuses in line with the speakers. That way, if any DC hits them, it should blow the fuse before it blows the speaker. So, I've got my leads here with RCAs to my speakers. And then we've got some banana plugs just to make it easy. I assume that each one is the bank. I know they've done A is all the top speak or top terminals. So I'll just get BNCs just make it easier not having to fit around with these silly binding posts and bare wire which always wears off eventually. So I'll just hook it up with no signal in it, turn the volume right down, see if our protector kicks in. There it goes, so these Sonys are often quite slow to do it. Not hearing anything. Source direct, tape dat monitor, loudness. You'd probably expect even a little bit of scratchy. I'm not hearing a single thing. So it could be something is wrong with the the amp. So I'll have to turn everything off before I mess with it. Now I'll find my CD output. CD player going. This is Always remember what input you're on. Since it's CD, I normally just go to CD. You can go to any input though, really, besides phono. Does this have phono input? I reckon it would, but yeah, it's old enough to still have a record player input, so it makes it a, a useful amp for hi-fi people still. Turn the volume down. Oh yeah, distortion in one channel. So that's pretty nasty, that might be what was upsetting the protector. So that is the right channel, and that's good. Alright, 
exactly. It was more noticeable on the piano than the guitar. It's still distorting. Actually, come good, I think. It's actually working now, so look, thankfully they've looks like they've labelled which is left and right, and they're actually on the left and right. So we know the right channel is okay. Ironically, that's the one with the most corrosion on that chip, whereas the left channel was the one that was distorted and is now working fine. So yeah, so that's I'm gonna have to probably let it cool down again, I guess, and see if I can replicate the fold again and see if I can just trace, I have to put a, a one kilohertz signal or something like that into it, a sine wave of any frequency will do really and just see where the distortion starts and stops it's pretty unlikely to be in any of the preamp section most likely it's going to be one of these output driver chips it's surprising because that side is in much worse condition and yet it seems to work better <laughs> so that's one of the things you get sometimes it's possible some sort of water's got into that chip. I would have sworn that would be the one that would be faulty because it's got green corrosion on actually on top of the chip, on the pins of the chip. So the sort of thing where the water will get down inside there between the sort of metal copper plate on the back of the chip for the heat sink and the, the plastic front of the chip can actually work its way in there, get into the actual chip substrate or up the pins or something like that. And that'll actually cause the the chip to play up but no surprisingly it seems to be working again I'm actually used to listen to heavy metal really because it's already distorted to a fair degree The useful thing about having the source direct is you can actually cut out the tone controls and stuff so I could have I might just turn this off again turn the power off and actually unplug it I don't know if they're getting very warm oh yeah that's oh yeah that is probably warmer than that should be you know they're both pretty damn warm so often these chips do run quite hot these pre-driver little amp chips which is why they get dry joints on them and fry the caps at least these older amps that aren't surround sound like the surround amp I looked at plenty of room in them so there's no well, some electros sort of near that chip that one there but they're all a reasonable distance away at least 10 millimeters or so so they got last a lot longer and there's just general a lot more open space to let the heat straight up and out of this thing so much better than the, the surround amps but I reckon I'm going to have to cool. One thing I don't have anymore is freezer spray, which was always handy if you just want to cool something down quickly. Give it a squirt of freeze spray. I'm probably sucking a bit of that heat out with my fingers. I should really check those caps of discharge before I put my hands in there, but that's where in a running amp they are, but it'd be interesting to have a look. Even though those pre-driver chips shouldn't have any high voltage on them. Yeah, it's only... show that, but yeah, there's only a couple of volts left on that one. Normally if the amp's running it'll drain those out. And three volts on that one. But these, the collectors of these output transistors will have your plus or minus 47 volts. So basically up to 100 volts sort of potential between them. So you don't want to go touching any of that. I think the solder joints are still good. Another thing that could be worth doing with corroded stuff is just re-soldering the joints on these. And you often see if there's a problem, like the corrosion's got down into the solder, 
which I wouldn't be surprised if it has in this. No point doing that pin, those two end ones aren't even connected, but I wouldn't be surprised if we get something sort of bubble up through the solder, a horrible smell come out of it, because it's got some sort of corrosive stuff in there. These are actually pretty good. So far anyway, but sometimes you'll find the solder will be all crystalline and horrible, like that pin was pretty bad. Probably should be where I can smell it a bit, but I pr prefer not to breathe solder fumes. But sometimes you will find a bad joint, it'll be all crystalline. The solder pulls back from around the pin. And yeah, if it's had some sort of corrosive stuff like cat urine or something in it, you'll soon smell it. But this, like I say, I don't think this has had anything that bad in it, but it's at least had a good soaking for a while. Hopefully with just fresh water, because no one wants to work on stuff that's, that the pet's urinated on. Or some other horrible thing like that, even beer and stuff's pretty horrible when it's been in these things. But it does happen, unfortunately. Let's try it again from coldish, or well, not real cold, but yeah, there's still a bit of warmth in those chips. Better get my hands out of there before I plug it in. Uh, yes, on CD. I'm off to one channel. Source Direct button actually is a little scratchy, which is not surprising. You'd, I'm surprised the volume control seems perfect and all the other controls. That's the only thing that's scratchy on this. It's doing pretty well. They did make them out of good quality, like Alps pots and switches that normally lasted pretty well. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the yeah, Alps. I can see written on the side. I think, yeah, Alps Japan. So they're pretty good quality. And a lot of these hi-fi systems didn't get too much abuse and use, so people would set them and listen to them and not fiddle with everything all the time, like kids with their ghetto blasters and stuff. But interestingly, it actually stops the balance control from even working when you hit the direct. I would have thought that would still be in line, but that takes that out. I guess if you're going to make it direct, you, you want people to lose all their controls to make it look like it's actually going direct. So yeah, so I'll have to leave this till it's cold again and then I'll see what it does. I've resoldered both those chips. Uh, but this board's definitely going to need a bit of a... I would at least pull those chips off and clean around it. Some of those wire links possibly want replacing, a couple of resistors. These earthing points want cleaning up and any rusty screws can be chucked out and replaced with some clean ones. Looks like we need to our front panel apart and give the direct switch that's this thing with a great big set of contacts on there give that a clean really wants the front boards checking anyway but they seem to have escaped the worst of the damage thankfully so something's probably just gone through where's the top of it moved it a mile away but yeah the place where the water gets in is at the back yep is obviously through where the vent slots are usually you find something's been dripping down. We might be able to see something on the inside here. There's a, yeah, yeah, this, this part here, you can see a sort of white ring around that one there, yeah, a bit further across. There's actually a bit of corrosion type deposits of something inside the lid there. Other side's quite rusty and got that white stuff underneath. So some sort of white, I don't know if it's a mineral deposit or it's something to do with the metal or other materials corroding like the coating on the metal the vinyl or something but you can definitely see areas where it's been reasonably wet probably for quite a while that's not just a one-off spillage or if it was it would have to be something fairly nasty but on the outside here very hard to pick but now i know where it is i can just see it on the the vents so if you're ever buying something it pays to look for stuff like that i mean the rust underneath this one is a dead giveaway 
and yeah if anything that looks like it's had sort of water near it you'd really want to take the lid off and check it before you purchase something like this but I think he was more interested in buying the speakers anyway and this was kind of thrown in or something but I think we can resurrect this okay but if it was mine I would probably replace both those chips I might have a look see what they cost and then clean everything up replacing anything check all the capacitors as well just quickly yeah, it's possible that we've got these bias pots here but they look okay surprising this that one's a little bit if it's ironic that the the channel that seems to be distorted is the one that's in the best condition but that's the way these things go but yeah it could be there's some sort of growth between some of these things but I'd, I'd, most likely I'd say 90 percent it's one of these chips guess it'd have to be the left one is has got some sort of corrosion affecting it but I'll find out what are they UPC 1342 I think V may even have to unsolder one or take the front panel off to read that properly but yeah it's a 1342 V just make it out so I might see what those chips cost I might just quote him for I guess it's probably gonna need to be yeah, well whether it's worth doing you may need a couple of hours work depending how much how well he wants it to go whether he's you know fastidious about it or not but he could be up for a couple of hours work to clean this up properly and change both those chips that one looks a lot worse than the other one but given the corrosion I would if they're only like ten dollars each or something I would probably just replace them and be done with it because they're the most likely things to play up in these things anyway and I wouldn't mind betting we find one of those is faulty when it's cold and given that the corrosion on this one's really bad that one's not actually doesn't look too bad you could almost clean that one up but I think I'll just quote him for that and see if he, what he wants to do and maybe yeah just at the same time replace a couple of these resistors that look a bit crappy and corroded check all the capacitors change any of them if they need doing yeah, I think that protection circuit's pretty good I mean the relay wants pulling off probably even those caps want pulling off just to clean up make sure there's no corrosion under them they're glued down pretty well with that white stuff by the look of it and you know maybe even things like the bridge rectifier just remove it and just clean everything some of these speaker connectors and stuff might the same just unsolder them and take them off the board just make sure there's nothing between the pins between where on the circuit board side where they've been sitting because water obviously flows under things and that's where it tends to actually stay the most because it can't evaporate as quickly so it'll hit the board and then go under these electrolytic capacitors the actual capillary action will pull it under it'll pull under this relay it'll pull under these connectors and you know even things like these resistors anything that's flat on the board with a very small gap to the board it'll suck in there and it'll just sit there and of course the warmth and stuff can't get there as quickly so you actually get it sitting there more than anywhere else and corroding it worse than anywhere else but i'll see what sort of money he wants to spend on this thing he might not want to spend you know anything on it if you if it's just the thing he got with some other stuff but it's going to be up for uh, yeah probably best to quote a couple of hours on this by the time you mess around even just the fault finding i've still really got to find out what's wrong with this but i can let him know even now just what I think it'll need doing I would pretty much guarantee changing those chips will fix that distortion problem really not much else it can be but I would like to get a signal in there and at least we can have a look at it and maybe learn something about how to trace a distorted channel because it's something I've been looking for is an actual amp with a distorted channel to actually do a bit of fault finding on because just all the amps I've purchased recently have all been blown fuses and silly things like that so at least I might get a good video out of it and we can look at just tracing the signal through and the points where you do it and yeah I'll say more than likely it's going to be around those chips we can find some clean signal going in and a, a distorted signal coming out and like I say it might be so badly distorted or whatever that at the beginning it's putting some some sort of bad bias on these some sort of DC that shouldn't be there these are putting out a bit of DC and that's stopping the protector from clicking in but as it warms up or whatever it's obviously losing that and going back to normal I can see some more crappy solder joints here a couple that aren't the best so really because of the corrosion it's often best to even possibly resolder the whole area so really this I don't mind 
pulling some of the parts off this um, because all this area that's been where the corrosion's been really wants resoldering ideally because I can see some joints aren't the best and at the same time you'd probably I guess ideally change any of those wire links that are corroded with fresh wire links even just for to make it look better but I don't sort of trust those things usually once the corrosive material's gone it doesn't make them any worse it always sort of worries me that you know from where I live it's not high humidity but if it's high humidity sort of area it's possible that they will keep corroding if there's any sort of whatever if it has had a chemical in it or pet urine or something like that beer or soft drink or something that can keep corroding so it's ideal that you replace them all and you know, just for cosmetic reasons so someone doesn't open this up in the future and look at it and go wonder what the hell happened to it but again, that takes quite a bit of time if you've got to do that, but they want resoldering at a minimum. And yeah, these resistors with the sort of green on them, it may well just clean off. It's probably just on the surface, but usually stuff like that, I'd prefer to replace it. Thankfully, all the little diodes and stuff look pretty good, but it's possible one of those is also faulty because they're just tiny little ones and it doesn't take much for something to, to soak up into them, even though they're fairly well sealed. If they're sitting around long enough in water and stuff, it can start making the corrosion on the leads go up inside the actual device and cause a dodgy junction or something in there but anyway we'll get back on with this and see what it does okay i'm back on this sony amp i couldn't actually get the thing to play up um, but what i did find is when i press on the the loudness switch uh, not the loudness switch the source direct switch uh, at least when it's in, if I fiddle around with it, I can actually get the the left channel to distort. Now that it, once it's out, doesn't can't really get it to do it, but it is dropping in and out a little bit if I fiddle with it. And um, yeah, but other than that, I can't get it to distort, and the the speaker protector seems to cut in all right and everything. So I've actually pulled the front panel right off this. You've got a, a metal outer part here, and then there's a plastic bit. I only took the metal bit off because the headphone socket just has this comes through the hole and has this little metal clip on it so you've got to remove the metal to get that off and so you can completely remove the front panel so I thought at least I can work on this a bit easier and just have a quick play with it again I don't think there's any bad solder joints on that but that's another possibility I may have to unsolder this switch because I can't see any real easy way to get contact cleaner in there even when I unsolder it, there may not be I might have to go down through the actual shaft it feels a bit wobbly but they're all fairly wobbly these things so you can see what's, what the inside of the front panel looks like now I've got our various controls so we've got a volume control here it's a dual pot plus a tap for the um, loudness I think it's got a second tap on the other channel yes it does because I did download the service menu and have a quick look got these interesting dual gang pots here with staggered it's got the upper part three which will be the left or right channel the three terminals come out on one side bend down to the board and the other three come out lower and go to the board on the opposite side so I don't think I've seen that before or don't really remember seeing it before and the volume controls the same that's also got a tap a loudness tap and that comes out above the on the other side above the lower level so that's a bit of an interesting thing so i'm hoping i can power this up again i've got our selector switch for input selection this bit's just a mechanical linkage so i've just got that poked around the back there so it can't short anything out hopefully better keep it away from anything on that board but that's all right there i've got this board plugged in we've got our that's just our power lights or leds there's a dual led there and the power switch just is actually on a connector you can unplug same with the this is a speaker selector and headphone socket that's on a big connector that i actually unplug this when i remove the panel initially you had to remove the headphone part to get this board out because this part's all in the way so i might put something plastic under that just to make sure it can't short onto the chassis there just while i run it it's probably fairly right but because it sits on top of the headphone socket but I don't want to risk shorting out the speakers or anything and I think I've got all the inputs disconnected off this at the moment yeah everything's unplugged so I'll plug it back in again and 
get the speakers back on it. If I can find the ends of the plugs. Okay, I'm plugged back in again. Nothing shorting out anywhere, just got to be a bit careful. I'll turn the switch on first so I don't have to touch that because we've got live 240 volt terminals there, or they will be once I plug the power in. This board's all live, so you've got to treat that with extreme caution. Even the secondary side of this transformer, because we're up like plus or minus 50 odd volts or something, at least by the time it's rectified and filtered, so that's a potential shock hazard as well. And yeah, you know, anything in the power section here, output stage is all got to be treated with caution now that we're getting into the higher voltages. So I'll see if I can power that up. We have power on, we have our LEDs on. So yeah, there goes the speaker. And I'm probably off to year one channel. Okay, so the power LEDs are on. This panel's pretty safe to touch because this is all low voltage stuff, or should be. And our direct, if I put in the direct switch, we get a couple of orange LEDs there light up. So I'll turn the volume up and... Currently both channels are fine. No distortion. When I touch that switch, it's fine. But we're going to have a direct on. I'll just go that way. Oh, on direct, the balance control doesn't do anything, so there's not much point doing that. But if I press this, what I can do is disconnect one channel at the speaker, so I don't have the one that's good. It's actually a bit dodgy on the back there by the sound of it. Ooh. Okay, so we had a bit of a loose bit of dropping out on that channel until I turn the the um, binding post right in, so they're a little loose. Which probably is a normal thing with these for all I know, because I don't think I've ever, normally when you put the speaker wires under them, they're tight. So the fact that I'm using banana plugs bypasses, that's, that's something else to look out for. That Because the, the thread wobbles up and down a bit, it was actually disconnecting. i fix that. You can hear a bit of clicking there. Doesn't want to do it. Oh, I did it a bit. Now that I've pulled the front panel off, it actually works quite well. It was very touchy before. So I think I'll just give this a dose of contact cleaner and see if I can make it any better just by squirting it through the top there. Do. I probably should just turn the power off for a minute. I'm not sure this should just pull off, but you've got to be super careful you don't break these things. How does that come off? It's like a weird double layer of soft rubbery stuff. So I think I'll just try and get this down in between. Right, so I'll turn it back on again. 
way for the speaker protector again. Got it slow on this thing. Certainly got rid of the crackle out of it. That seems to remove the crackle. Yeah, so that probably was all that was causing that. Of course, once I Often as I do, when I was fiddling around with it yesterday, I usually give all the different controls a tweak and play with the switches because often you can find problems with things just doing that. I might even resolder the connections, I think they're okay. It's, they're so fine it's a bit hard to tell. But I just thought I'd see if I can actually get this, get that distortion problem fixed. Which I think it was just that switch which I'm not sure why a direct switch would cause that. It seems to bypass basically the tone controls as you'd expect. And at the same time it switches in some resistors, which is the equivalent of turning off the loudness control, which I guess makes sense because it also bypasses that. But while I'm here, because these joints don't look 100% to me, but it's probably just the way the solder's sitting it doesn't seem to be shining that joint definitely didn't look the best there's something up with them but I think it's just the way they've done it in the factory it's probably fine but sometimes you look at these things and they just don't look quite right I think it's maybe it's to do with that corrosion the solder just lacks a bit of shine and a couple of the joints don't look as and it might just be because they're lacking shine they don't look as good as they should they don't look as sort of as domed normally got a nice sort of red, sort of domed blob of solder if they're a funny shape or something sort of hollowed out you know there's something possibly wrong but I think that's all right so I might just I think we'll reassemble the front panel now, I've actually put all the nuts and stuff back on onto the controls because sometimes it's just a good way not to lose them since I haven't bothered getting a container or a bag or something to put them in since I'm just sort of pulling this apart and doing it all day anyway I had to look at this a bit earlier then had to go out and do some stuff so I just sort of left put most of the parts back where they should go and I put a couple of screws left them in there just for the power switch so I better get that get the power completely unplugged this board has to go in first it's got a few little clips and stuff wasn't too hard to pull apart but there are some plastic clips there there and on the end that prevent it coming out even once you've undone all the pots and stuff so now we've got our buttons back and we've got to put the nuts back on all these pots before we even start to put the other controls back although I don't think all those are on this one there's only the speaker selector Oh, an input selector, so it's actually got a spare. It must have been made for another amp. Similar model, I think there was the service manual for this one has another model in it as well. Whether that had some other feature there or it could have been some completely different model. I think there's a lower power version of these. This one, depending, I think, the, I don't know if the, I forgot to look in the service manual to see what they rated this one at. But, um, anywhere between sort of 40 and 60 watts people are saying they're, they're rated at but you know if it's got a single like a single pair of output transistors on each channel it's usually somewhere around the 50 watt mark and if I've got four output transistors like two a pair two complementary pairs I guess so four in total two of the MPN and two of the PMP then that's usually around 100 watt output 
probably all depends on where the distortion kicks in and stuff. Most of these modern amps are pretty good on being low distortion, so they can do the sort of the maximum out of those transistors, I guess, which is up around the 100 watts for four and 50 watts for two. But I did forget to look in the manual to see what it said, but it's it'd have to be around the 45 to 50 watt, I would think, maybe 60 watts if you really push it and probably get a bit more distortion. But yeah, I think safely you could expect around. 50 or so out of it. Now, what was this? That was the LED. Which, where is the LED thing? I've unplugged that. So I can pull this little plug again. I'll just put that power switch back in there. Oh, the LED, that's it. I was going to say there's just a hole here for the LEDs, but that's because I was wondering where the diffuser was, but that's on the actual aluminium part. Just had me worried for a minute that I'd lost something. And um, yeah, just put the screws back on the, the switch there. Make sure that's up nice and tight. Yeah, it's just a hole where the LEDs go. A couple of little clips there. That just clips in, but the actual Diffuser parts, it's just, you can see them bare there, the actual diffuser parts on the aluminium. And I think I've got to put, yeah, I've got to put the, um, yeah, i better move the, oh, someone's, it almost looks like that's already been jammed up in the control there at some stage. Maybe it does sit in that little bit there. Is that how they've done that? I'm not sure what they've done there. But we need this board here, this one again unplugs. There's a little clip on one side, you just press in and pull. And now we've got our speaker selector and headphone. Oh yeah, that little wire. Probably should push this out of the way a bit. Get rid of our plastic. Yes, yeah, so that little wire going to the LEDs looks like it fits in between those three little posts there. And the headphone and the selector there. We've got a, there's a couple of screws for the selector. Headphones, just this little plastic clip, which I'm not sure it just slides into the threads there, but I see me just push that home and it doesn't feel quite right. There it is. Felt like that went into a particular slot. That's nice and solid. And the selector switch needs a couple of screws back in it. Magnetising your screwdriver is always useful for this sort of thing. Just rub it on a magnet and that'll magnetise it a bit and then it'll probably lose it and then you rub it again and after a few days it'll be pretty good and keep its magnetism and we've got our selector switch here which I also put the nut back on just so I didn't get them mixed up or anything. I can probably put that on last anyway. I think that's got a bigger nut on that one. So I should be able to put this back, put the aluminium, that just sort of clips. Oh, there's some screws underneath as well. But yeah, there's a couple of clips up the top here. One where my thumb is there, and another one there near the LED. And I'm not sure if the bottom, possibly there's a clip there. I think that might just slide on. So I'll get that selector out of the way. Start to think about putting this all back together. I might put that speaker plug back on while it's in a convenient position here. Just make sure that's home, top, and bottom because the bottom hasn't gone on. Now we can probably plug our AC back in. Maybe I should have left that. Oops, get the pins in the hole. And now it's about us getting that front. Front panel to slot onto the base, which one end's done, but the other doesn't seem to want to go. There's always something about them that's a bit picky because it's hitting on the side there. Now we're home, I think. And there were some black screws, I think three, three little black screws that went under there.
and something. At least get this amp to sort of behave itself. At least it's got it going for the guy, for, even if he doesn't want to pay for me to clean the board up, but I think it will. I won't charge him too much to clean that switch and then we'll give the board a clean, remove a few components. And I think this will be pretty right then. Ideally, probably replace the chips in it. But they're over $20 each, about $22 each, I think, plus postage. At least to get them locally, you can get them a bit cheaper on eBay, but you never know what the quality is like of some of that stuff on eBay. Whether it's a real chip or some sort of knockoff version or something. So I'm always a bit wary. And even then, they're still $13 odd or something, and who knows how much postage. So it's not a massive saving. I think I'd prefer to buy one from a reputable seller and hopefully it's a genuine, even they could be dodgy, but hopefully it's a genuine NEC part made in Japan as it says on the front of the chip, but you never know for sure. So I'm going to plug this connector back in here for all the front panel, tone controls and stuff. Yeah, this other thing gets in the way a bit, but it's just a little push in each connector. Yeah, I probably should have left that other one put the function control in after I did this since this doesn't want to quite go in right now and now I can fit the knobs on luckily these all are D type shafts so they're easy to put on because with the spline shafts you've got to line them up again whereas these are just going to be in the right spot because there's only one way to do them probably should get that knob a clean really but and the hole around it, uh, wrong way around. I was gonna say, that didn't feel like it was going on, but that's why I had it the wrong way. And the volume. Yeah, ideally probably should remove all those and clean it if, if he wants to get the board and that done and might give it a, a clean up for him, pull all the knobs off and clean it up a bit. But yeah, that's interesting. Those were being loose and made them cut in and out, so I, I can't say I've ever noticed that before. If I pull the banana plug out and tighten these things up. Mm, they're really wobbly, these ones. Normally they're a bit better than that, I think, but anyway. Something to watch out for, I guess. Okay, I've put the... Power switch on, speakers, that front panel control, that's back in place. There's one more screw, I think it's got to go back in there. Well, there are a couple on the ends, this looks like there were. So each end of the panel, I think, had a screw in it. These little gold sort of plastic thread ones rather than self tapping type things, rather than metal threads. One in there, which has an arrow pointing to it. there which has got rid of all our screws except for the cover screws which is always a good sign so I was hoping this was going to be a nice little chance to track down some distortion in an amp but doesn't look like it is there goes a speaker protector CD input Yeah, doesn't have much volume here. Oh, well, I'm probably on the wrong input is why. Well, eh? Oh, what up? It'll be the tape monitor. You've got to be super careful. Always turn the volume down <laughs> if you get it and it's just like that. Hardly any sound. If I hit the... It's because I've pushed, when I put the front panel on, I've pushed the, the tape DAT monitor, digital audio tape monitor thing. So as soon as I hit that, it's going to come back at full volume. So make sure you turn the volume down, because that's a common thing. You can blow your speakers if you're not careful. You turn it right up and think, why is there no sound? And then you're like, oh, it's that button. Press it and bang, comes on at full volume and you've got it cranked right up to 30, 40 watts or something.
that channel again. Yes, that seems to be all right now. There's no crackling. I can't make the channel distort or crackle or anything now, so that's a good sign. Probably should try the other inputs as well, just to make sure they're all working. The more things you try, the better. Just make sure there's nothing funny going on. Being careful I don't touch my hands on anything I shouldn't hear. So I've got an auxiliary input. I always wobble the switches around just to make sure they're not making crackling sounds or anything. It's a sign they need to clean. Tuna. That's all good. I'll put it in the phono, even though this is going to be way too much level for phono, just to make sure the sound's at least there. It'll be distorted. That's a good enough test for the moment. I haven't had one yet, I don't think that if it did that there was any problems with it. Usually best to test it with an actual low level phono type thing and to get tape I assume we press this other monitor switch in. There it is. So I just noticed the speaker select the switch is a little bit off. I thought it looked a little bit eccentric and swapped the knobs. Didn't make any difference, but it's definitely closer to one side of the hole than the other, but I've, I've mounted it back in there properly. So that's probably been knocked at some point slightly to the side. I don't think anyone's going to notice, but just one of those things that... I can see it's not sitting quite right, but it's all working alright. So I guess I'll just give this another test from cold again. Probably tomorrow evening or something and see if it's still working, and I'll talk to the guy tomorrow. I might even take it along and show him and see if he wants me to actually spend a bit of time to clean that up a bit. But I think it's probably just that source direct switch was the only real problem with the thing. Causing that distortion, which, like I said, it's a bit odd that a switch would cause distortion, but I guess if the contacts aren't quite right, it's a possibility. Normally you'd expect them to go a bit just lower volume or something, so I don't know quite what it's doing or whether the contacts were touching two things at once that they shouldn't and bringing them in, into contact not really sure there I guess if, if it's sort of some sort of weird maybe it's not just a high resistance it's more acting like a weird diode or something like that is possible with contacts and it's sort of rectifying it a bit or some weird really weird thing like that you never know but like I say, you expect it to make it scratchy when you're moving it. But if you held it in a certain position, it was definitely making the left channel distorted. So I don't know, yeah, I don't know if I've had that with a switch before, but they do do some weird stuff occasionally. So I think that'll be the problem with that. I just, of course, once I pressed that switch when I was fiddling with it after letting it cool down, it didn't play up again after that. And the only way I could do it is press the switch in whereas it was doing it on the out position before but if I pressed it in and fiddled with it a bit I could get the channel to distort so I reckon that part's right so I might take this along without the cover on it and show him what it looks like inside and um, yeah he can decide what he wants to do with it whether he wants to spend a bit more I'll just charge him a minimum charge order for looking at it it's probably going again but I, I do think I'll recommend that we clean this board up a bit Spend another half an hour or something on it doing that. And hopefully that'll get it 
not only going but keep it going for quite a while I would like to get the stuff off these chips because I don't like the look of that just in case this stuff is still a bit corrosive whatever it was which it possibly is if it was just pure water it's probably okay but if there was some sort of chemical or something in there then there's a risk that if this gets moist again which it probably won't but if it does it may eat away at it again I want to clean that earth contact up properly and put, replace these rusty screws at least the one on that earth terminal wants doing because that could possibly introduce noise or something if it's not at earth to the chassis properly and it's again causing a sort of high resistance joint or something so see what he wants to do and I'll let you know